I guess you saw the introductory slide. I'm um, Cyril Gay. I'm the national program leader for our uh, animal health national program at uh, ARS, Agricultural Research Service. And this last discussion really reminded me, um, some of you may have read my bio, but, but why I'd wanted at one point in my career to work in the pharmaceutical industry and as well as taking up this topic of alternative antibiotics because it's it's all about providing products for veterinarians to be able to practice veterinary medicine. And we all know that, you know, throughout our history, we've always had to use products off-label, human drugs. You know, we need the, those tools to practice veterinary medicine, and that's, that's really critical. So what I want to do with you today is I'm going to tell you about Agricultural Research Service, uh, not because my agency or anybody told me to do so, but uh, because I work for ARS and I love my agency, and I just want to share a few points about ARS in case you didn't know uh, what we do. And then I'm going to focus on antimicrobial resistance. I know you guys know a lot about this, but I, I want to show you some of the history, background, and connect this with this issue or th this initiative that we call alternative antibiotics. And then briefly, at, at 50,000 feet, I want to tell you about you know, these alternatives to antibiotics. What, what's it all about? What are they, and and why they may be some of the future? And then I'll just have some uh, conclusions. So if you go to our website, ARS, if you Google ARS, you'll you'll see this is the front page, and there's you know all the information you'd you'd want to find out in terms of all our our research programs at Agricultural Research Service. In the context of of AMR. Uh, this is the organogram of the USDA, and uh, I just want to point out that ARS is, is right here, another agency that you may have heard of. It's called the uh, National Institute of Food and Agriculture. That's our extramural research uh, branch. They're the ones that give the grants, funding it to the veterinary school. <coughs> ARS, we, we actually do the research. But there's some other important agencies within that organogram. Uh, you have APHIS, the Animal and Plant Health inspection service, and you have Larry Granger in the back. If you don't know Larry, wave your, your hand. He leads the AMR initiative within APHIS. Uh, Food Safety Inspection Service also is an important agency. Um, Horn Ag Service, they deal a lot, you know, in terms of the issues with, with trade. Just to show you that we have these different agencies that actually, you know, have some involvement on AMR, and we kind of spread, you know, throughout uh, the... the um, the USDA, and we have different reporting structure to different undersecretaries. When you go back to ARS, I always like to go back to this slide because this is the Bureau of Animal Industry, and some of you may never have heard of this, but that's actually the history of ARS. And this gentleman that you, that you see here, Daniel Salmon, DBM PhD, obtained his DVM from the first class ever to receive a DVM in the United States. Now, how many of you in the room are Auburn graduates? I guess I'm the only one, but I'm just curious. Actually, he didn't graduate from Auburn. You guys know what school that was? No. Exactly. So a little history there. But what's interesting is we talk about One Health, and here you have Theobald Smith, a medical doctor, who actually was his assistant. Now, what's interesting is you've heard of the pathogen food safety, salmonella. Well, that's where it came from. And the actual discoverer was actually Theobald Smith, and he gave the name to the pathogen, his boss's name. So he was very astute right, right back then. But over the years, this, this team, there's been a lot of medical doctors and veterinarians way back then that actually worked in concert. Um, you know, we didn't have these separations that we do today. And today, our agency turned into Agricultural Research Service. Some of you may, may know it. We have over 1,500 scientists and postdocs. We are a $1 billion agency. Uh, we have some 90 laboratories spread across the country, and the entire research portfolio is divided into some 17 national programs. So they're listed here. Uh, they're under four divisions, and one of the things that I want to point out is animal health. 
This is the uh, national program that I lead. There's nine laboratories, which you may have heard, the National Animal Disease Center in Ames, Iowa, Plum Island, where we study foreign animal diseases, the Southeast Poultry Research Lab, where we're studying avian influenza. Um, but if you look at these percentages here, that's where the entire investment is being made. So even though we started out as a Bureau of Animal Industry, today we're only 15% of the entire research portfolio. So agriculture has, has expanded, and we certainly do things from human nutrition to food safety research. Uh, plants are obviously very important, uh, as well as natural resources and management. The uh, animal health or even those programs, one of the points that I want to make out is even though um, I placed emphasis based on input from our stakeholders on antimicrobial resistance and alternative antibiotics, actually you will find research in several other programs besides animal health in this area, uh, including animal production, food safety is, an, is another big one. So AMR is actually a big issue and it cost cuts a, a lot of our research programs and our commodities, even plants, believe it or not. At the end, I want to leave you with this uh, message in terms of our mission. ARS, we're, we're mainly a problem-solving agency. So what is the problem? And that's what we focus and we apply basic and applied research to solve those problems of high national priority. So let's look at antimicrobial resistance. This is one of my favorite slides because today, you know, we talk about we're losing our antibodies. If you look all over the world, this represents all of these uh, initiatives to actually restrict the use of antibiotics. In fact, when you hear alternatives to antibiotics, that has a connotation that, you know, we want to remove the use of <coughs> antibiotics. You know, antibiotics are, are bad. But, you know, that's not the case. Antibiotics is probably one of the greatest discoveries, you know, of the 19th, 20th century in terms of the availability of something that we can use through human intervention to control infectious diseases. And this is the father of antibiotics, Alexander Fleming. And this is a little quote from when he accepted his Nobel Prize for the discovery of penicillin in 1945. 1945, that's, that's not that long ago, right? Just imagine, I always think about my grandfather who fought in World War I in the trenches, they didn't have antibiotics. I mean, that, that's just incredible. But what's important about that quote, when he accepted the Nobel Prize, he, he stayed right up the front, right up front, but he was already seeing resistance to the use of penicillin. Okay? So it's not <coughs> EMR, antimicrobial resistance. When we think about antibiotics, it's not anything new. Right from the get-go, we already knew that when we use an antibiotic, this pathogen is going to be a selection. Some of them are going to mutate. They're going to, to uh, develop evolutionarily all of these antimicrobial resistant genes. And, and that's the nature of our fight against uh, infectious diseases. Now, the OIE, I didn't hear the, the name mentioned OIE, but you know that's very important for us uh, veterinarians. Why? Uh, before you ever had a United Nations that came out with WHO, the World Organization for Animal Health, or the Food and Ag Organization, we had the OIE, the World Organization for Animal Health. Back then, as many of you know, OIE stands for the Office Internationale des Epizoti, or in English, the International Office of Epizootics. It was set in 1924, and... Based in pairs, they're still there. They represent 180 countries, and uh, including the United States. And they're a very important organization. Talk about bees. Uh, by the way, they have whole manuals on bee health, tools to control diseases, etc. So there's a lot of important information. And um, in, in excuse me, in 2013, they organized this uh, symposium, which was called the Global Conference on the Responsible Improving Use of Antimicrobial Agents for uh, animals. By the way, we, something was wrong with that first slide. I gave you my, my uh, email address. You'll see it in the last slide. But if you want any reports, information from my presentation, 
just send me an email and I'll send it to you. But the OIE has added that symposium on their website a lot of recommendations on how can we address this issue of antimicrobial resistance. And I just took one of them here because they say that, you know, it's going to be important to support relevant research and to find alternatives that could be used in animal production for anti antimicrobial agent substitutions. So that was one of the recommendations that, that came out. And, and in fact, before that, in 2012, with their support, I had organized a symposium on alternative to antibiotics. And this is one of the things that came out. Now, moving forward, some of you may, may have seen this. This is the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, PCAS. And they came out with this report to the President on combating antibiotic resistance. And at the same time, then uh, the President and OSTP, that's the Office of Science and Technology Policy, came out with this national strategy for combating antimicrobial resistant bacteria. And in those documents, you will see a lot of recommendations, as DOIE did. And when you look at PCAS, one of the recommendations was to expand fundamental research relevant to developing new antibiotics and alternatives for treating bacterial infections, and specifically to develop alternatives to antibiotics in agriculture. Now, those national strategies, I participated in them. Larry Granger and some others of my USDA colleagues. What was very interesting, usually agriculture has, doesn't have much of a, of a footprint in a lot of these national strategies. But there we were very much included in agriculture as part of the solution. So that was a very, very much a One Health effort with FDA, CDC, NIH working in concert to identify recommendations that are going to be, you know, meaningful. But specifically in the national strategy, as you'll see here, under Goal 5, Research and Development, they said that, you know, we need to incentivize development of therapeutics and diagnostics for human and animals. So let me hold here one, one minute. Incentivize. Well, a lot of the discussions in the last session was about, you know, we, we need tools, and we have these antibiotics, and we're totally focused on the ones that we have. And, you know, we're coming out with all sorts of complex regulations to safeguard their use. Because on the human side, they're telling us that we have medically important antibiotics, and we're losing them due to antimicrobial resistance. And there's really nothing new in the pipeline. So when we think about things that are important, not only in human health, but animal health, I mean, that is really, really critical that we are losing those antibiotics. And there's all sorts of initiatives that I'll continue and share with you to try to preserve, you know, those, those medically important antibiotics. But let's not kid ourselves. When, when it said medically important antibiotics, they're not talking about antibiotics that we're using in animal health. They're talking about human use or, or human antibiotics. That's what they want to preserve. And that's what's driving this interest in our use in animal health, strictly because there's the perception that when we use those antibiotics in animal agriculture, that leads to antimicrobial resistance for you know, human pathogen. But when we look at veterinary medicine, let's not forget, antibiotics are critically important for our use to treat and prevent diseases. So when we talk about preserving our antibiotics, I mean, that's just as important for veterinarians. And so when we talk about um, any strategy documents about preserving these or, or reducing the use of antibiotics so that we can preserve these medically important antibiotics, I think it's just as important in veterinary medicine as it is in human medicine. Now, the, the last thing here, as you'll see, is that they talk about establishing and promote international collaborations in pub public-private partnerships to incentivize uh, the pharmaceutical companies to actually invest in the development of innovative drugs, which we desperately need, both on the human side and, and veterinary uh, side, especially when we think about infectious diseases. And importantly, as you see, I've under underlined here, that uh, antibiotic resistance, including new and next gen generation and other alternatives to antibiotics. Some of you may have heard this Presidential Advisory Council 
um, combating antibiotic resistant bacteria. That was one of the offshoots of this national strategy. Uh, you'll recognize Long Yi King here, who's often a speaker, and we'll see tomorrow. He happens to be the vice chair of what we call this PACARB. And they're very much looking now at uh, therapeutics. They're looking at vaccines and diagnostics to very, with a very focus on what can we do to incentivize the development of what they call point of care diagnostics or vaccines and, and, and therapeutics, not only in human health, but animal health. So agriculture very much in animal health is intertwined and included in all of these initiatives. And in PCARB, um, you know, it talks about the fact that we've now, the government, the U.S. government has developed a national action plan, but most of the agencies that have a mission in that area have also done that, and this is the USDA Antimicrobial Resistant Action Plan, and I don't know if you've ever seen that, but it's available online. Online, I've got the, the, the website here where you can have it, but there's important initiatives uh, that we've identified at USDA to undertake to address this issue of antimicrobial resistance. So the first objective is uh, determine and or model patterns, pur purpose, and impacts of antibiotic use. Uh, I was just invited a couple of weeks ago by the government in Canada, and they were inviting me because they, too, wanted to have an action plan. And I learned a new acronym. It's called uh, AMU, and AMU stands for antimicrobial use. And, uh, you know, in our animal production system, apparently in Canada, but we know that that's the case as well, uh, we're not sure where we're using all these antibodies and how much. And we know that on the human side, you know, looking at agriculture, there's a lot of emphasis on, hey, you know, you need to reduce the use of antibiotics to preserve these medically and important antibiotics. And I already shared with you what they really mean by that. So that, that's a big initiative, and that's identified in, in this action plan. The second objective is, uh, if I may just translate, it's all about monitoring antimicrobial resistance in uh, food safety pathogens um, in some of our pathogens. Now, we know that we still have, whether you're looking at respiratory diseases or what have you in animal agriculture, you know, the fact is that we are losing some of these antibiotics due to antimicrobial resistance. Now, for me, I don't know how you feel. These, these are very important. Those are important initiatives. But, you know, they sort of point at the problem, right, for very good reasons. And one of the reasons that I personally wanted to work on this area of alternative to antibiotics is because I think we need some solutions. And the solutions are, in fact, that we do need, as I said at the very start of this presentation, we do need tools to practice veterinary medicine to prevent and treat animal diseases, and that's critical. And so this third uh, initiative talks about identify other management practices, and it refers to alternatives to antibiotic use. So let's talk about alternatives to antibiotics. Before I get into the, the next segment of this, this uh, presentation, I want to share with you that I didn't say alternatives to antimicrobials. I did tell you that alternatives to antibiotics are in fact products. And I specifically identified alternatives to antibiotics because we have to go back in time, back to Fleming, and remember, you know, what are antibiotics? Uh, antibiotics are substances that are produced by microorganisms to essentially compete in an ecological niche. So whether we're talking about soil, whether we're talking about on the surface of, of plants, whether we're looking, you know, in, in our gut or, you know, uh, anywhere we look, these bacteria are competing and they produce these antibiotics. And uh, naturally, through evolution, um, before men started using antibiotics and we started to see resistance and Fleming had warned us, you know, these uh, bacteria were in fact producing uh, these antimicrobial resistant genes to compete in that, in that environment. And so when we say alternative to antibiotics, it was with the premise that we need to start looking 
at innovative drugs, alternatives to what, what we think about, you know, when we think about classical conventional antibiotics. And so that's an important point that I want to make uh, up front. But before I do so, I want to go back to the OIE and some of the initiatives that, that they've taken. And this right here talks about this workshop that was uh, put together um, in April 2015. Now, a lot of you may not have heard about this. The only reason that I know about it is, is I was asked to chair this ad hoc group. And it was really fascinating, not because I chaired it, but because they focused on vaccines that could reduce antimicrobial use in animals. Now, here you go again, you know, reduce the use of antibiotics or antimicrobial use in animals. Strictly under the premise that if we use them, we're going to see selection and we're going to see antimicrobial resistance. But when you think about alternatives to antibiotics, right, and you think about vaccine, that's probably the quintessential alternative to antibiotics, right? Because if we can prevent the disease in the first place, then we wouldn't have to treat the disease with an antibiotic. And we sort of forget about this. Um, you know, I said the antibiotic was, you know, one of the greatest discoveries of the 19th century, but another one, if you think about it, was vaccines, right? Think about our uh, tremendous breakthroughs in the discovery of vaccines. The, the thing that I want to share with you, though, in veterinary medicine, we're, you know, it's a dichotomy, and I'm going to tell you why. On one hand, we probably have advanced the development of vaccines on the veterinary side. We're mo way more advanced than they are on the human side. Now, that, that sounds very strange to say, but, but think about it. Look at molecular vaccines. Look at the number of vaccines that we've developed. You know, people talk about DNA vaccines, recombinant vector vaccines. You know, think about Diva strategy, MARD vaccines. We've eradicated pseudorabies from the United States thanks to a MARD vaccine. I mean, we're fairly advanced in the development of our vaccines. But yet, we actually have a lot of vaccines that probably are not, you know, that good. So what, why is that? You know, I said this is a dichotomy. You know, on the human side, they're just now getting some of these molecular vaccines. So, so why is it? is it? Is it that veterinarians, you know, were smarter than, than medical doctors? No, why, 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 why have we done so well in the development of these innovative, you know, high-tech uh, vaccines? Can anybody tell me? Well, if you think about it, if you go to a vaccine company, I mean, uh, a vaccine meetings on the human side, they talk about models, models, models. You know, on, on the veterinary side, we have the animal models, right? We can actually test drugs and vaccines <coughs> against real diseases in a relevant host. Our cattle, our sheep, our goats, our pigs, our chickens. Unlike on the human side where they have to go to a mouse, and somebody said earlier that a goat is not a cow. That, that's true, but we certainly that know that a mouse is, is not a human being or a cow or anything else. So that's given us a lot of advantages. And not to digress, but this is something that, that I'm very passionate about. You know, our regulation, often we go, okay, so we have these animal models, we'll test these vaccines, and they work. Right? We do vaccination challenge trials. And, you know, why, do, why does it work? Well, who cares? You know, it works. And that's been the dichotomy that I'm talking about because actually, if you go back to what the OIE here did, they asked this fundamental question. Where do we use antibiotics the most? And what diseases do we use them for? And where are the vaccines, right? Again, if we had the vaccines, we wouldn't have to use antibiotics. That was the premise of this ad hoc group that the OIE put together. And they looked at pigs, poultry, and fish. And if anybody wants that report, I, I have it. But essentially, this is just one slide from that report. Uh, here, I just use swine as an example. And what you have is all these pathogens, the antibiotics use, as you see, high, medium, high, high. And then it's got, you know, do commercial vaccines exist? Yes, yes, no. And then what are the constraints? And it's interesting that for bacterial diseases, we forget that those are probably very challenging to develop vaccines in terms of the efficacy, maybe more challenging 
than viruses. But one of the things that came out of this, this, uh, this workshop was sometimes you have the use of antibiotics because of viral diseases for which we have poor vaccines. In the case of swine, PERS, right, where you have primary viral infections followed by secondary bacterial infections. And there's other constraints, in fact, that some of these diseases are actually very difficult and the vaccines don't actually work very well. And so there's a need to actually invest in uh, some of this basic research, uh, understanding mechanisms of immune evasion, understanding mechanisms of protective immunity. We take it for granted, but I will share with you that today we know a lot about mouse and human immunology, but we still have our challenges with understanding animal immunology. Can anybody tell me why? Why is our, why, how come we know so little about bovine immunology or swine immunology? I mean, we know a lot, but there's a lot of things that we don't know. Do you, you know, compared to human or mouse immunology, do you know that? Do you know why? We actually, we don't, we don't even have the immunological reagents to look at T-cell markers, et cetera. I, I, this is my, my plug for, <laughs> there's an investment in research, and we talk about vaccinology to solve these problems where our vaccines actually don't work for very t difficult diseases. The low-hanging fruits, we've done them, but there's a lot of, lot of gaps. Some of the outcomes of that mean, very quickly, vaccine research could have a significant impact, particular if it addressed the following broad gaps. Maternal antibody interference, cross-protection. That's a huge issue. We have a lot of pathogens. If you don't have the right one, you know, you're not going to get protection. Occurrence of immunological interference. You know, we like convenience. We like to have all these fractions in one large vac vaccine. But the fact of the matter is that they work as one fraction and it may not work in a larger combination. And lastly, innovative delivery systems to enable mass vaccination. That's certainly the case for poultry. Or we talked about agriculture or feeds. You know, that, that's an important area. So I just wanted to share that with you about vaccines because that is an important area. And that probably is, as I mentioned, the quintessential alternative to antibiotics. So alternative antibiotics, what are they anyway? You know, what's the definition? Well, alternative antibiotics are broadly defined as any substance that can be substituted for therapeutic drugs, but are increasingly becoming ineffective against pathogenic bacteria. And no, we added viruses and parasites. Yes, we talk about antimicrobial resistance in terms of bacteria, but let's not forget parasites. Right, the miracle drugs, the ivermectins, we're we're losing them, right? We're losing our parasitologists because we've been been reliant on these miracle drugs. But we're seeing more and more drug resistance, you know, for parasites. And you look at viruses, antivirals. Uh, we talk about avian influenza. You know, the drugs that we have on the human side, our first responders. If we ever had a zoonotic high path avian influenza, I mean, that, that's a key issue. So just to make the point that when we look at this area of alternative antibiotics, it's really, it's really broader than just bacteria. Not only because some of these pathogens, in fact, lead to the use of antibiotics, as I mentioned, but also because of, of the fact that we also need antivirals and an antiparasiticide. How much time do I have? Don't take as much. Okay. Um, I want to sh share with you some of the meetings that we've had in the past to, to grasp and put our hands around these alternatives to antibiotics. In terms of the research, what's in the pipeline, you know, what are some of the opportunities that are before us. And the first thing that I want to share with you is this workshop that was held last year uh, at the National Animal Disease Center. I organized a, a lot of meetings, and we do it well at USDA, right, Larry? Because the first thing that we do, we organize a meeting with no money. And so what do we need? We need a free place to stop, to park. Right? So we held a meeting at one of our labs, the National Animal Disease Center. How many of you have, have ever been there? Beautiful place, isn't it? And we're very fortunate uh, that Congress gave us those facilities, and we want to put them to good use, not only their conference room, but obviously all their research lab. But as you see from the title here, we wanted to do a gap analysis of these alternative antibiotics, and we included plants, because yes, we use antibiotics on plants, fruit trees, we included turkeys, chickens, swine, uh, dairy, uh, beef, and 
By the way, there's this website here that you'll see over and over at the bottom of my slide. If you Google alternative antibiotics, you'll find it, but it's a resource center. And you will find the reports from that meeting on that website. In fact, all the presentations, all the posters from any meeting that I organize, it's all there on that resource center. And there's a lot of valuable information. So you'll find the report from that meeting there. And just want to share with you very briefly some of the research priorities that were, you know, identified broadly coming out of this workshop. So one of the first things in terms of research is the discovery of antibiotic alternatives with defined mechanisms of action. I haven't given you any examples yet of what they are. I mentioned vaccines. I'll do that, you know, in a few minutes. But, you know, mechanisms of action is really, really critical in terms of understanding how they can be used. In fact, when we look on alternative antibiotics, yes, we use them quite effectively in veterinary medicine for preventing and treating diseases. And let's face it, we use them quite effectively for growth promotion as well. So we're going to need alternative antibiotics for animal production. But, you know, what were the mechanism of action by which antibiotics work so effectively in terms of growth promotion? You know, we probably didn't really understand those. So anything that we, that we develop, those mechanisms of action clearly are going to be important. And the second point is, I, I hate to say it, but they not only have to be safe, but they have to be effective. Right? We really need to do these studies with these new alternative antibodies, these products, and really understand, you know, and ensure that they are effective and how they're effective, where, what doses, etc. The third bullet says the discovery of alternative antibodies for the prevention and treatment of infectious diseases. Because we think about, you know, there's a bad connotation about prevention, but we did use them effectively for prevention, you know, they're important. They're, they're in fact, they're maybe cheaper, right, to use tetracycline, you know, in the feed to prevent metaphatic, you know, metaphylaxis approaches. And, and that's how we use them quite effectively. So we, when we look at alternative antibiotics, new product, we need to look at treatment and prevention. Uh, the fourth bullet is discovering alternative antibodies that are, are less susceptible to antimicrobial resistance. Well, going back to what Fleming said, I talked about selection. Anything we use, you know, you're going to have selection. And these pathogens are smart. Whether you're talking about viruses or bacteria, you know, they're going to find a, a way. So in the 21st century, can we actually engineer products? Or can we identify products that are going to be less susceptible to resistance? So that's one of the research priorities that was identified. <coughs> and lastly, uh, discover alternative antibiotics to maintain the health of animals throughout their production cycle. Well, that sounds like an obvious one, but let's peel that layer of that onion a little bit. You know, when we look at agriculture, when we look at poultry, right, we want to keep our animals healthy. So how, how do we do that? Right? We, today we talk a lot about biosecurity. Genetics. We talk about nutrition. Right? It's all about raising that, that level of resistance tolerance through vaccination. All of these elements together to ensure that, um, you know, I, I guess in your presentation in agriculture, you said at the end that they're floating and happy, you know, you've reached, you know, the, the, the goal. That, that's what we want from an animal welfare perspective, et cetera. And so when we think about these alternative antibiotics and anything we use, we, we have to think about it in that context. In terms of priorities for development, regulatory pathways. Do we actually, uh, I'll cover again, give you some example of what these alternative antibiotics, but it's fairly broad, but are they, are they drugs? Are they biologics? You know, are the regulatory pathways in place? to actually enable the development of very innovative products that maybe go beyond what we're thinking about when we think about the development of an, of an antibiotic, you know, MICs, et cetera. That's going to be really critical. Uh, I talked about business incentive to invest in the development of new and innovative drugs. 
whether it feed additives, drugs, or biologics. Let's face it. I mean, that, that is an issue. You know, what is going to entice a pharmaceutical company that has to be responsible to shareholders on a quarterly basis to actually invest in the development of these new drugs and alternatives? That, that is definitely an issue. And in fact, that's been one of the main things that this PAC card that I mentioned has been focusing on. Uh, third bullet, antibiotic alternatives are very distinct molecules with very different effects, doses, and mechanisms of action, and they need to be developed accordingly. And lastly, conducting a general evaluation of the effect of antibiotic alternatives on production performance is difficult but paramount in achieving commercial success. What, what, what do I mean by that? You can meet the regulatory requirements. You can get a registration. That's critical. I mean, you can't deliver and get those products in the hands of our veterinarians for their use in the practice of veterinary medicine. But you know, producers, especially in animal agriculture, they're not going to use them unless they see a return on their investment. So we have to take these products in our, in our production system and, in fact, go beyond what we do in terms of uh, pivotal clinical trials to register them and actually show their effectiveness. Now, we have a lot of feed companies right now, uh, companies that are investing in feed additives that see that gap and that are generating a lot of these uh, alternative antibiotics. If you Google alternative antibiotics, you'll see that website that I mentioned. But every week, you'll get inundated with these alternative antibiotics. And in fact, our producers in these workshops have told us, you know, it's not a week that somebody doesn't come up to me and ask with this, you know, this feed additive, this plan, or what have, what have you, and we don't want to dismiss it, but how do we know that, that it works, right? And that goes back to what I said earlier in terms of understanding mechanisms of, of action and, and, and the importance of actually taking some of these products through the regulatory process to identify what is the effect of dose, you know, what is the expected outcome if we use those. So, um, you know, all of this, you know, is going to be important to enable and, and achieve their commercial success, which at the end means they're used by the animal health and veterinary community. So the last thing that I want to talk about is this symposium that we organized with the support of the OIE. I mentioned that we had organized one in 2012. Four or five years later, we wanted to ask the question, okay, in 2012, one of the outcomes was Boy, there's a lot of new technologies, but they're all very much upstream and not a lot of investment by the pharmaceutical industry in their development. In fact, most of the activities that we saw was, you know, feed companies, feed additives uh, that we saw. We see the same thing happening on, on the human side, right? These nutraceuticals, it's turning out to be a multi-billion dollar, uh, you know, industry. And we're seeing the same thing on the veterinary side. So the question was, you know, what is in the pipeline? Is there anything that, you know, breakthroughs? Are some of these products being developed? What can we do to enable their development and commercialization? And the key question that we asked right off the start is, you know, a paradigm shift for antimicrobial drug discovery, bacteriocidal, bacteriocidic, or new approaches that target virulence or modulate the host response. So going beyond, you know, what we think about classical antibiotics. Second, you know, should it be broad spectrum versus narrow spectrum? You know, we want broad spectrum. By this, we don't have to figure out, well, you know, on the human side, they're talking about this point of care diagnostics. People are talking about the same thing in veterinary medicine. We'll give, you know, this diagnostic test, and you can figure out, oh, I've got this bacteria, and is it res resistant to X, Y, or, or, or Z? Um, okay, that, that may be, you know, uh, an approach, but, you know, there's probably, if we're concerned about developing next generation drugs that are going to be less susceptible to antimicrobial resistance, it may be that we're looking at narrow spectrum. Now, when we use them, that means that we're going to probably have to use many of them, right, because we can no longer have this broad spectrum. Or maybe we can have the broad spectrum and, and address this issue. 
of antimicrobial resistance. After all, we're in the 21st century, and the innovations that we have today in our research pipeline is just simply mind-boggling. Uh, the co-development of interdependent products. Right? It may not be that we have the miracle antibiotic you know, that does all these things. It may be that we're looking, again, at a, a lot of different products that we're going to have to use collectively in our production, production system to meet the goal of ensuring that these animals are, in fact, going to be healthy throughout their production system. We already do a lot of this, but we may have to look at this more and more. And that may be doable if we understand the mechanisms of action and what these products will, will do very specifically. And lastly, you know, achieving disease-resistant outcomes, or should it be achieving disease-tolerant outcomes? Right? Because when we talk about disease resistance, we're talking about a very specific mechanism. Right? Some of you may have heard of peri-resistant pigs. Right? I, mean, I think everybody's heard about this in the room. Right? So in a way, uh, the inventor of Miz University of Missouri have identified the receptor. Actually, there's two or three of them. And using gene editing, you know, they were able to mutate the receptor for the PERS virus. That is luck, what we call serendipity. I hate to say it because, unfortunately, that's not going to occur for a lot of our pathogens, because I don't want you to start thinking that we're going to make pigs or cows resistant to all these diseases, because our pathogens that we know, they're very promiscuous in terms of how they answer different cells. But it, but it, but it was done, right? Uh, so um, that, that's an example of resistance. But for a lot of these diseases, you know, I talked about genetics, uh, products that can modulate the immune system. We used to talk about adaptive immunity. We talk now a lot about innate defense mechanisms that we're learning a lot more about. Who's heard about toll-like receptors? Got a smart group here. But toll-like receptors is part of the innate defense mechanism. It's one of many components of the innate defense mechanism. Where were they discovered? in insects. That's where we discovered them. And then we started looking and said, hmm, I wonder where the mammalian species have it. Again, I'm, I'm trying to give you the plug for what's going on in research and why it's so important in the discoveries that, that we're making. Okay. This is the, the program that we focused on, vaccines I already talked about. Let me just spend just a few minutes to talk about some of these pods. This is not a scientific meeting, etc., but Microbial-derived products. Okay, what's in the pipeline? Well, I already talked about gene editing, and some of you may have heard CRISPR-Cas9 and other gene editing technologies. It's really fascinating, but the concept is that maybe now, you know, for those of you that, that may not be aware of this, you know, it was a discovery in bacteria that they actually have an immune system, a very primitive immune system, like insects using toll-like receptors, and, and what they had is this nucleus where they could actually target, uh, you know, a, a, a virus, like a bacteriophage that would attack them so they can essentially inactivate that virus as part of the, the defense mechanism. And scientists discovered this nucleosase and said, well, you know, if we can target them using a sequence, uh, a guiding sequence, we can actually edit anything that we want. In fact, that's the technology that was used to make these pers resistant pigs. But the thinking is, well, when you have bacteria that have acquired antimicrobial resistant genes, could we use that technology, you know, using a bacteriophage to target these specific bacteria and alter them so that they can now become, you know, uh, susceptible to specific antibiotics? That, that is a question, and some people have shown experimentally that that, that that can be done. Now, the challenge is that actually bacteria, you know, have, as I talked about selection, actually have mechanism to, to counter that. So, you know, this is science, it's biology, it's complicated, but that was one of the uh, technologies that was discussed. Another one is, how many of you have heard, I'm sure you have, about the gut microbiome, right? I mean, this is, this is big, right? So we have high-throughput sequencing. You know, we can't sequence 90% of these commensal bacteria that we have in our gut. 
but we can sequence them, and we know that they're there. What do they do? Well, we now know that they're important in terms of the development of the immune system of neonatal animals. We know that they're important, you know, uh, in nutrition. And we all know that for a lot of anterior diseases, uh, you know, we, t we know we've known about probiotics, but they play, play a key role, right? Every time we have a dysbiosis, we have pathogenic or other bacteria that take over the, the gut, leading into all sorts of anterior diseases and inflammation, uh, diarrhea, et cetera. So the, the question that was posed at that symposium is, you know, we don't know what constitutes the, 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 the gut microbiome of a, of a fish, of a dairy cow, of a beef cow, of swine, et cetera. But can we start, you know, getting closer? And in fact, on the human side, some of you may have heard of fecal transplants for people that are very sick. It sounds nasty, but it works. And can we do the same thing with, with animals, but be more defined in terms of the microbial cultures that we can actually transfer? So this, this is, you know, the discussions that, that is ongoing, uh, you know, under, under that category of product. Let me just touch base maybe on one more, and I appreciate your patience. I know I've used more than my 35 minutes, but I told me I could use some more time. But another one is during World War II, D-Day, right, is when we had the first use of antibiotics. Right, the Pfizer's and all these companies actually generate tons of them to make them available to our troops. At the same time, the Russians, what were they doing? You know, they, they weren't looking at antibodies. They were looking at, you know, bacteriophage therapy. So that's the route that they took. Now, we know that in, in East Europe, in Russia, they, they still use a lot of these uh, bacteriophage cocktails. The problem is, as I mentioned for CRISPR-Cas9, these uh, bacteria will develop resistance. So they went in using these bacteriophage cocktails, and you still get resistance. Question is, what are these bacteriophage using in terms of their antimicrobial microbial activity? And they have a lot of antimicrobial uh, genes that encode antimicrobial peptides, endolysensing. There's all, actually a lot of antimicrobial products that we haven't even thought about, about developing. So the, the message is, when we look out there in, in nature, there's all sorts of things we've been focusing on a few antibiotics, really, if you think about it, what we've developed. There is an enormous amount of things out there in nature that maybe we could develop as additional tools to combat uh, bacterial diseases. Phytochemicals. You know, we hear about herbal medicine. I talked about the feeds industry. Well, we're doing a lot of research now where we're finding out that some of these phytochemicals actually can modulate the innate defense mechanisms, very specifically, where we actually may be able to enhance or increase our level of resistance. That's research, but there's also a part that you know, potentially could be developed uh, for use as alternative antibiotic. Now, I mentioned that the, the, the issue is that a lot of them already are being sold as feed additives, question is, can we invest in actually identify the actual ingredients, the actual dose, you know, against a specific uh, disease, do the clinical trial, register them, you know, as actual products, as drugs, or, or biologics. The next one is immune-related products. Let me just share with you just a couple of them. Uh, some of it is, is probably old technology, but, uh, you know, poultry, birds, they don't produce IgG, they produce this IgY. Some companies have found out that, uh, in fact, ARS scientists, one of them, <laughs> Lillehort, in my program, have found out that, well, if you immun immunize hens, they'll produce tons of these IgY antibodies. And if you can understand what to immunize them against, so if you look at coccidiosis, like poultry, one of the big issues is necrotic an enteritis. If you know the right antigen to target, you can actually immunize these hands to produce these IgY antibody. You can process it and put it in a feed. And for uh, enteric diseases, we actually could potentially prevent these diseases. So that's you know something that doesn't sound too sophisticated, but that's one of the technologies that's in the pipeline. 
Another is this whole area of host antimicrobial. Who would have thought that in our gut, our epithelial cells actually produce antimicrobial peptides? In fact, thanks to the animal genomes, which we now have, we know we have the chicken genome, we have the bovine genome, we're discovering when we're doing these host pathogen interactions that we're actually producing these antimicrobial peptides that are part of our innate defense mechanism. And so there's also some molecules there that we can actually may be able to use. Another one, you know, we've talked about for 50 years, interference. <coughs> Out of this, uh, you know, back then we used to talk about interferon singular. Now with the bovine genome, do you know how many interference, interferon genes cattle has? Our scientists in Plum Island actually have discovered this. There's over 46 genes that produce interference. I just want, you know, just tell you, I mean, the discoveries is just mind-boggling, and those different interferons work differently. And it's all there before us, you know, to research and develop as alternatives to antibiotics. And lastly, I'll just tell you, tell you about these innovative drugs. Uh, we had some presentations from a group at Harvard. Um, Karen Holster, who's sitting there from the Pew Foundation, actually was one of the chairs of one of the sessions. And I think I don't know if it was you or somebody else that talked to these researchers, but, you know, in terms of changing the paradigm, instead of looking at bactericidal, bacteriostatic, can we target virulence genes in terms of a drug? And, you know, what, would that work? And actually we're finding out that actually that may, you know, you may not get rid of the bacteria, but by targeting the virulence gene, you actually may incapacitate that pathogen and it actually may work where your immune system may take over. Anyway, I'll stop right here. I thank you for your patience. I know that I've given you a lot of different uh, examples, but I wanted to share with you what's in the pipeline. Some of the conclusions from that workshop was, uh, again, defining the mechanisms of actions of alternative antibiotics <coughs> is paramount to enable their effective use. A portfolio of alternative antibiotics may need to be considered to achieve optimum health and disease management for different animal production systems. Um, there is a need to integrate now nutrition, health, and disease research. Okay, that's going to be critical going forward. Regulatory support and new approaches to enable the licensing of alternative antibiotics is going to be critical. And in order to incentivize their development, you know, I think public-private partnerships are actually going to be important. So we at ARS when we make these discoveries, how can we partner with a commercial en entity and actually work with them to mitigate the risk in terms of their investment in the development of that alternative antibiotic, that product? That is also applicable to academia and anybody else. I think that's going to be very important. After all, we're talking about animal health. Sometimes there's not a huge amount of money to be made on like human drugs, et cetera. And so to make it work, we really are going to have to look at these partnership, not only within the research community, but again with some of these commercial partners. So in conclusion, my last slide, just three things. Uh, technological advances are providing new research tools and opportunities that afford scientists a hitherto unprecedented ability to solve 21st century problems, including antimicrobial resistance. Scientific discovery is delivering promising new tools and technologies to take, in a, to take on seemingly intractable uh, diseases. And there's many of them, as we know, in, 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 you know in, in the world of animals. And lastly, there's a need to establish public-private partnership to develop veterinary medical countermeasures that are designed for a specific purpose.